بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all for coming out to the first session of the conference in which obviously in the morning times some people are still trickling in, still waking up, still getting their coffees and their energies. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you all for being here as well as for all of those who have facilitated this convention and this conference and these sessions for us, the volunteers, the institutes, the organizers, the staff. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward them all, bless them and their families. Say Ameen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward all of those who are facilitating sign language for our brothers and sisters who are in need of it. Say Ameen. When you hear the word cheat sheet, what comes to mind? What are some thoughts that come to mind? Oftentimes, if you've ever had a teacher in high school who told you, for your exam, for this upcoming exam, you can have a cheat sheet, but it has to be on an index card. And you got excited, your creativity, mashallah, in writing in like three-point font or printing it on the index card like I've seen some students do. Mashallah, why, why do we get excited? Why do we do that? We feel that coming to this exam, this thing that's really important to us and we've placed a value on, that we have some guidance, some reminders, some clarity. And this is a really, really, really minor analogy to the title of this session. The cheat sheet for life, your entire existence, your purpose, morality, good, evil, relationships, transactions, how to live life, how to govern, how to communicate, how to forgive, how to love, and of course, how to navigate fear, sadness, many other emotions. The session is really about the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the Qur'an وَشِفَاءٌ لِمَا فِي الصُّدُورِ It is a healing for what is in the hearts. It is a spiritual, psychological healing. And of course, it is a healing for many other things as well. It is a light for every darkness in society, a guidance for every form of misguidance in this world. It corrects everything that is deviated. It gives clarity to the one who is sincerely looking for clarity. It is a book of guidance. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep our hearts attached to His speech. Allahumma ameen. When you receive your syllabus for a college class, university class, on the first day, some students, and I count myself amongst them, one of the first things we do is we try to find out what's required to get an A in this class. What do I need? What are the assignments, the percentage for each of these requirements? What are the criteria of success here? With life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not create us and leave us without purpose. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is perfect, far above such a thing. And when we re truly reflect as human beings on our human condition, on our emotions, on the fact that amongst everything we observe in this world empirically, we find that we truly are unique, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us for a purpose. And as we reflect, we see that clearly, teleologically, everything has an organizational end function. Everything we observe has some kind of purpose, some kind of direction, some kind of end in mind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us consciousness, metacognition, the blessing of language, advanced civilizations. We should feel like we have been honored as human beings. But some human beings take that honor and throw it away. And others receive it and act upon it with gratitude. When we look to the Qur'an, we find a beautiful reflection, one of the verses of the Qur'an, that if you were to frame it in calligraphy, put it on your wall, desktop, wallpaper, wherever you see it, it would be one of the most profound verses of the Qur'an for introspection. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an, the great companion of Qur'an, he says there weren't even four years that passed by from the time that we became Muslim to the time in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rebuked us with the following uh, ayah, with the following verse. أَلَمْ يَأْنِ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَن تَخْشَعَ قُلُوبُهُمْ لِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَمَا نَزَلَ مِنَ الْحَقِّ Has the time not yet come for those who believe? You claim you're Muslim, you believe. For your heart to become humbly submissive, moved by the remembrance of Allah. Is it not time? In other words, how much time do you truly need how much time do you truly need for you to finally say, it's time for me to change? What are you waiting for? Because if subconsciously or consciously you think 
Tomorrow, you've already fallen into the trap of the devil. If you procrastinate improving your emotional, spiritual condition, for tomorrow, you've left something really important, really valuable at risk. Because tomorrow is not guaranteed as a mentality. Tomorrow, later, next week, next year, I'll connect to the Qur'an, I'll become more re religious, more practicing. I'll take care of my mental state, my emotional state, my spiritual state. If you keep procrastinating, what might end up happening is that you might die upon that procrastination. You might never take care of that problem. And we don't want to be people of regrets. If not now, then when? Tomorrow is not guaranteed. Let's always push ourselves today to start in the midst of a lecture with at least the intention. That, Ya Allah, I'm going to begin right now. Ya Allah, this is my intention. Ya Allah, I will start taking actions. I will start moving forward. I will start putting in more effort. That I truly mean it, Ya Allah. How is the Qur'an a cure? How does it help with these emotions we are discussing? How does it help with living our lives with a so-called cheat sheet, a manual, a guidance? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us in the Qur'an reminders. The one who created mankind, the one who created us with an elevated status, gave us all that we need to be reminded not once, not twice, but numerous times from the beginning to the end of the Qur'an. How many times do you hear about the afterlife? How many times do you recite verses about paradise? How many times do you read about persevering, enduring, and the emotional states and the emotional difficulties we go through? How many times do we hear about the afterlife and the connection and the meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Why are they repeated? Rather than discussing paradise once and sabr, endurance and perseverance once and the afterlife just once or twice, they're repeated over and over and over again, 6,236 verses. And we find hundreds of ayat about the same concepts. It's because we are in need of reminders. But when we become distracted by a dunya, distracted with our jobs, tempted, distracted by our families, chasing certain worldly things, chasing materialism. What starts to happen is we choose to cut ourselves off from that reminder that is a cure for us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Remind, for verily the reminders benefit the believers. When you recite the Qur'an on a daily basis, you are being reminded. When you listen to it frequently, you are being reminded. When you study it frequently, you are being reminded. What happens when you're reminded? You're given that boost that you need in that moment from checkpoint to checkpoint, a reinforcement of your faith or of your optimism. You're coping your resilience with hardships in this world. You're reminded why suffering exists. You're reminded of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. Importantly as well, the Quran gives us as a cure, the reality of expectations. And from a psychological standpoint, I want you to imagine, I know we're all generally in agreement here, but I want you to imagine someone who is not in agreement with us, and they believe their expectation is that this life, a dunya, should be a life in which there's no suffering whatsoever, no discomfort rather, no hardships, no pain. And they want a perfect house, a perfect spouse, perfect wealth and health and children, everything else has to be perfect. What are they really looking for? What are they asking for? They're looking for Jannah. If your expectation of a dunya is up here where Jannah is, you're going to be disappointed every day. And you're choosing to be disappointed. Why? Because you're basing your expectation not on reality, but rather the deception of a dunya. Because the reality of a dunya is down here and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that. Reminds us of that. So when you read the Qur'an, you're reminded to set your expectations in accordance with reality. So that your, your hurt, your pain is not magnified. That why did this thing happen? Why does this exist in this world? But you know the reality, the fact, the objective reality as Allah describes it in terms of why this world exists. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us of paradise in the Qur'an. How many times do we read about Jannah? Do we listen to lectures about Jannah? And in that moment, we start maybe dreaming of it, being motivated, ambitious. When you're going through pain, you feel some relief. You, you feel that you're able to hold on a little longer because you know that it's worth it in the end. 70 years, 100 years, even a thousand years in this world, if you were to hold on to your faith 
and that's all that you had in this world and you lost everything else of a dunya, may Allah protect us all. But if you lost everything of this world and you held on to your faith, at least you know Jannah is waiting for you. At least you know there's eternal bliss. At least you know the first step into paradise will wipe away an entire lifetime, an entire existence of pain and sadness in this world. Fasbir. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds, be patient, persevere, fasbir. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, O believers, istainu bis sabri wa salah. Seek your help through, turn to perseverance, holding on to your faith, being strong, having willpower, and through prayer as well. In the Quran, we're reminded every day about decree and pain. We're reminded about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will versus His love. And there's actually a really important misconception I want to address here. Oftentimes, when we say Allah wanted this to happen, we, we actually make the mistake of confusing the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the love or hatred of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala towards something. For example, I can ask us all and I think it's a very easy question. Does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala love for His creation for human beings to hurt and oppress one another? Yes or no? No, absolutely not. Does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who created us with free will, does He love for us to disbelieve in Him and reject the truth? Yes or no? No, absolutely not. It is a fact. Allah does not want for His creation to choose the path of arrogance or rejecting of truth. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love and hatred of something is not what we are actually discussing. It is the fact that Allah allows, allows, so His will permits something to occur in this world. Rather, many things to occur in this world. For wisdoms known to Him, wisdoms we cannot see or access as limited human beings. But we have to trust in something. And since we don't have access to that knowledge and that wisdom, we must trust in the one who is Al-Hakim, the one who created us, the one who is Ar-Rahman, wa huwa bi kulli shayin alim, knowledgeable of all things. That there are multiple intertwined reasons between and connecting everything that happens in this world. Billions upon billions of factors. Ibn Taymiyyah rahmahullah says, the irtibat, the tying in of so many things in the universe, we cannot possibly understand. And yet, we trust. That trust must be directed towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He allows things to happen. Yes, in that moment, they are painful. But there is a wisdom for it. And all of this goes back to the purpose of this life. It is not Jannah. Yes, there is a world in which there is no pain. Yes, there is a place in which there are no trials or tribulations. But you must use the guidance given to you in this world in order to make it to that place. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the highest levels of Jannah. Say Ameen. When you recite the Qur'an as a shifa, you're reminded لَتَرْكَبُنَّ طَبَقًا عَن طبق. You will go through stage after stage in this world. Think about where you were 10 years ago. Think about where you were 2 years ago. 2 years ago, we were here at Masikna. Would we have imagined talking about a pandemic? Would we have imagined having masks all around? Would we have imagined such a scenario just 2 years ago? We go through phases in life and as children grow we see this and as we grow we see this and nothing is permanent. Do not attach your heart to any stage of your life. Do not attach your heart to any stage of your life, for it is not permanent. You will go through stage after stage, phase after phase, blessings come and go. May Allah bless us all and preserve us in what we have. But nothing in this world is permanent. And the greatest reminder of that is death itself. That we will depart, and it's not a sad thought. That we will depart to a better place. And in fact, I did not intend to mention this, but as Dr. Nadim was talking, this came to mind. These two specific emotions that are mentioned in the description of the topic here, fear and sadness, are actually intertwined in the Qur'an numerous times. They're connected numerous times. And the context in which they are connected are always about those who succeed, the believers. It's always about passing the test of this world, holding on to your faith. One of my favorite verses by far is the saying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Fussilat. <laughs> Verily those who say, my Lord is Allah, and then they hold on to their faith. It's not going to be easy. <laughs> they hold on to their faith. <laughs> the angels will come to them at the time of death as your soul is leaving your body, and they will say what? Have no fear. Do not be sad. Have no fear. Do not be sad. 
وَأَبْشِرُوا بِالْجَنَّةِ الَّتِي كُنْتُمْ تُوْعَدُونَ But instead, have the glad tidings of the paradise that you were promised before. Fear and sadness will not exist for the believer who holds on to their faith. No matter how, li how life is in terms of its difficulties, or how extreme pain is, hold on to what you know will completely and permanently erase all fear and sadness. A question comes up often, which is, how do I stay connected to the Qur'an if I don't even understand the Arabic language? And long story short, we have an abundance of resources, alhamdulillah. We have so many resources in this day and age to learn, to read the translations, to follow along the tafsir, the explanation of the Qur'an. We no longer have that excuse, alhamdulillah. And if you can join a program, have an instructor, have a teacher, attend a class, there are so many people who became Muslim and within two, three years started learning the Arabic language, started learning the Qur'an. A brother who had actually read and recited the entire Qur'an in his first year after becoming Muslim. This is not to discourage you or rather even to encourage you to rush, but rather to show you that it is possible. Connect to the Qur'an. In addition to this, some people ask, I feel like I'm trying to connect to the Qur'an, but my heart is not there. What can I do? One of the greatest reminders, recite as though it's your final recitation. Read the Qur'an as though you have no opportunity after today to read the Qur'an. Pray as though it is your final prayer. As the Prophet ﷺ advised, we had a, a brother in one of our communities in Michigan who was diagnosed with late stage cancer. And they told him he had several months to live. When we went to visit him, it was one visit that we had just to see him. This was the brother who used to open the masajid doors. This brother used to pray in the masjid. This brother was kind to everyone. When we visited him, he said, this advice of the Prophet ﷺ is so profound, but we don't appreciate it enough. And now I feel like I'm living it every day. Now I feel like I'm actually experiencing it. When I look at my family, I feel like this is my last chance, my last conversation. When I read Qur'an, I don't rush it anymore like I used to in the past. When I pray, I'm not rushing back to a dunya because I know I'm about to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the reality is, and this is what he emphasized too, you don't need a, do a doctor to diagnose you with death for you to know you're going to die. You know you're going to meet Allah Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Al-Afu, Al-Kareem, Al-Hadi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us what we need. So prepare to meet Allah as though every opportunity to recite Quran is your last. And on this note, I will wrap up with this. As you're disconnecting from worldly distractions and you're filtering out the reminders, the notifications on your apps, the time that you're spending on different uh, entertainments, leisure, whatever it may be, as you are disconnecting and trying to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you make dua, you ask Allah consistently and constantly for blessings in your time, in your day. You're watching the clock as the minutes and the hours are counting down and you realize you're getting closer to your meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You express everyday gratitude from the time you wake up. The first thing that you say is Alhamdulillah. Right before you sleep, Alhamdulillah for everything that I had today. Alhamdulillah uh, completely destroys various forms of sadness and depression according to a number of studies. Alhamdulillah, not just on the tongue but in the heart, living by it, really feeling it. Gratitude is a healing for so many of our problems and ultimately asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless your heart with life. The very least we can do is to make that dua. A young brother, 21 years old, comes to the masjid in Ramadan about 10, 11 years ago. After we finished wit witted prayer, he comes up and there are tears on his face. And I started talking to him as he's walking up to me and I said, Assalamu alaikum. And he didn't respond. He took out one of those phones at that time, one of those phones that had the keyboards on the side and he started typing very quickly. And so I realized very quickly, he could not hear me. He started typing very quickly, Assalamu alaikum, my name is such and such. He said, when I was 16 years old, my mother used to encourage me to memorize the Quran. And when I was 16 years old, I had just finished reciting my last verses to my Quran teacher. And a week after that, one week after that, I lost the ability to hear. He said, sometimes I feel as though I'm hearing the Quran from a distance, especially in Ramadan. He said, tonight I felt like I heard the Quran. And I'm not crying because I'm upset. I'm not ungrateful to Allah. I'm actually crying because I was given the blessing of being able to finish memorizing the Quran before I lost the ability to hear it. How many of us are grateful for the ability today, right now, at any moment you want, to go to your phone, Quran app, start reciting, listening to the Quran. How many of us are really grateful, thinking that, Ya Allah, the blessing of hearing that you gave me, I'm not even using it enough to listen to your reminders, to your speech, and I am the one who is in need of it. 
I am the one who's in need of this cure. If you really want to experience overcoming any kind of negative emotions, you cannot fully, comprehensively, efficiently do so without what Allah has revealed of Shifa. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a connection to the Quran on a daily basis until the day that we die. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to take the cure and the blessings of the Quran for our lives, our families, and our communities around the world. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us grateful for every blessing that we have and allow us to be people of optimism and productivity and constantly moving towards Him. Allah Amin wa salli lahum ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.